Well, good morning. Good to see everybody. Uh, if I've not met you before, if you're a guest this morning, if you're watching online, uh, my name is Cindy, uh, Cindy Porter, and I'm one of the pastors here at the Valley. Uh, I will be the campus pastor for the Sydney campus in fall of 2023, so we're really excited about that. I kind of bebop around between this campus and the Troy campus, whoever will have me. That's where I go, and uh, just good to be with you guys today. I was thinking a lot about this series. Um, I remember when we were talking months ago about this. You know, we don't just plan things out and you know, we spend a lot of time in prayer about it, like what's the felt need, where do we feel the Holy Spirit's calling us to teach or preach into something, and so I remember when we were looking at doing this series, and we were just talking about all the things in our life, the stuff we struggle with that really uh, is a battle in our life. It's stuff that is like a landmine, right? It's just always there, and we got to watch where we step, or others have to watch where they step around us. And I was thinking that this is such, uh, I don't know how to describe it, it has felt a bit heavy to me, okay? It's felt a little bit heavy because we're talking about addictions, and we're talking about shame, And we're talking about anger and fear. I mean, you say any of those words and they don't have a positive feeling to them or connotation. And as I was thinking through all of these, the one thing that just kept coming to mind is that there's just no quick fix to this. In these areas of our life, we just want it to be over because it's painful and it hurts us and we're held in bondage to it, and those people that we love that are around us are held in bondage to it. And we're kind of used to, in our culture, of everything moving fast right now. I mean, think about it. If we want to get a hold of somebody, we can shoot a text, and boom, instant communication. It used to be that I had to wait to go to the movie theater to watch a movie, right? Now we can stream something. It's in our home instantly. We can uh, order fast food, go through the drive-thru, and in a few minutes, if we're lucky, uh, it's fast food. And, you know, instant, uh, fast internet, all these things are just really, really quick. If I want something delivered, I can have it delivered tomorrow with Amazon. And so it's sort of creeped into every area of our life. We just want things to to be fixed, things to happen fast, and it's made us an impatient people. It's not done a lot for our patience, I don't think. And, you know, there's even, I was thinking about this, that even there, if, if I get online, there's, there's a Bible verse for the day. And it's wonderful. I love verses of the day. I love inspirational quotes of the day. It, you know, the internet, social media is just full of it. Everybody just posting all this stuff of the day, but it just is kind of fleeting. And by tomorrow, I've usually forgotten what it was. And so it's only natural then that we want these landmines in our life to be deactivated sooner than later because we want to stop the pain. But the truth is there are things in our life that cannot have a quick fix. There's things in our life that we have to dig deeper and we have to get to the root of it. It's um, things, the, the quick fix, the quick fixes for the landmines in our life, and today we're going to talk about anger, the quick fixes won't last, right? And that's why I have this shovel up here with me, if you're wondering. I'm praying it stays right where it's supposed to. It doesn't tip over. I have this shovel up here with me because it's a reminder to me. I want it to be a visual to us as we talk about anger this morning to remind us that there are things in our life that we deal with, things that we struggle with that will require you and I to go deeper. Wayne and I um, just moved to Sydney not long ago and um, we bought a house, and it's needed some updating and fixer-upper stuff. But before we even had the keys to the house, uh, Wayne went out and bought three trees. And I went out and bought toilet seats. That tells you a lot about us, doesn't it? And Wayne was planting these trees, digging holes, and he quickly found out, he said to me, you know, the soil 
the reason some of this stuff isn't growing really great is that the soil is not good. And there's big rocks in the soil. And as he would dig, they, they would be this big up to this big of rocks. And so one day he had, he had um, planted two of them, and he had started on the third. He was working on it. And I went outside to take a break, and I looked at that, and the shovel was laying there by the tree, and I thought, I can help with this. And so I picked up the shovel, and I had forgotten that shovels are heavy. And then I started loading the shovel up with the rocks and with this dirt, and my first thought was, put it down, go do something else before he sees you, and he won't even know you were going to help him do this because it was heavy, and I just kept going. I, I was just throwing the dirt and the rocks behind me, and my back was sore, and my shoulders, my hands started to hurt, but I wanted that tree to thrive, and I knew that the only way it was going to thrive is if we could dig out some of the bad soil and the rocks and replace it with the good stuff. And it made me think about this series, Landmines, addiction and shame and anger and fear. If you and I want to deactivate those things in our life, if we want to get them out of our lives, it usually means that we're going to have to dig deep. Now, I wish I could tell you there was a quick fix for it, but I truly don't. And as I prayed over this this week, I knew I could not just come up here and say, hey, here's a sermon of the, of the week, or here's a scripture for the day, or here's a quick fix and do this and do that. I knew that I had to tell you that we have to dig deep to have freedom from this stuff. It's the only way it happens. And I can say that to you because as I thought about all these things in the series, I have struggled with all of them, every single one of them. And the question becomes today for you is this, are we willing to do the work that it takes to dig deep? Are we willing to pick up the shovel because the shovel's heavy? <laughs> are we willing to load it up with the soil, the bad soil, the rocks, the stuff that's in there? And are we willing to say to God, as the psalmist said to God in Psalm 139, are we willing to say, search me, God? That's the first step. That's the first step, to get real with God and to say, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. Is there anything in me, Lord, that is, is wrong? Is there anything in me that's not pleasing to you? Is there anything in me that you look at that, and, you're, and God is saying, if you don't change this, if you don't get rid of this, you are going to struggle your whole life, and I can't do the things for you that I want to do for you. I can't give you the blessings that you should receive because you're not looking at the offensive ways. So God, see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me. I love this part because he doesn't leave you alone in this. He's right by your side doing the heavy lifting right alongside of you. He says, he will lead us in the way that's everlasting. I think that's the prayer that each of us needs to pray today. In fact, it's often been a prayer that I tried to discipline myself to pray every single day because things creep up on us. People, you, you may be sitting here this morning or those of you watching online, you may be thinking, I, I don't really struggle with anger. I, I don't have an addiction, or I don't think I have any shame. I really don't have fear that I know of, but it's just a good practice for you to, when you wake or before you go to sleep or when you're talking to God, to give him, to say, God, I give you permission, search me and see if there's anything in me. Has anything creeped in? Do I have any blind spots that I'm not aware of? 
So I want you to do, I want to see something. I want you to raise your hand, and I'm going to start because I am guilty of this. I want you to raise your hand if you have ever been angry in your life. Ever. Ever been mad or angry in your life. Some of you have never been angry. That is amazing. I want you to put your other hand up, leave one hand up, put the other hand up if, oh, some of you put it up and you don't know what I'm saying yet. All right. Put your other hand up if in your anger you regret something that you did. You regret something that you did in anger. Yeah. Most of us have both of our hands in the air. Well, today we're going to talk about it. Anger. Anger is defined as an emotion that is characterized by antagonism. Now, and whoop, I just knew that might happen. How about that for a catch? I'm going to lay it down. <laughs> I cannot be worried about that for the next 30 minutes. All right, so it's an anger is an emotion that is characterized by antagonism, and antagonism is defined as active hostility. Active hostility. These are like harsh words to me when I was reading this. So it's hostility towards someone or something that you believe have deliberately done you wrong. Does that sound about right? When we think someone or something, we've deliberately been done wrong, people often respond with anger. Now, we know some things about anger. We know that anger damages relationships. We know that anger can interfere with people's jobs at work. Have you ever all worked with an angry person before? We know that anger can come out at school. Children deal with anger. We know that it sabotages relationships, and apparently there is even this stress hormone that is activated when we get angry. So when we get angry, I guess... And it depends if you're a little bit mad or a whole lot mad, but you have this stress hormone that is activated. And studies say that this stress hormone can shave off time or years of your life. It is detrimental to our health. We know that really angry people, um, it creates social isolation for them. They just don't have a lot of friends. They don't have a lot of friendships because of the anger in their life. So that's what I call, you know, let's just call it, that's a bad anger, okay? That's negative anger, it's unhealthy anger. And that's what I'm going to talk about most of this morning. But I want to point out to you before we get any further that there is such a thing as righteous anger. I think it's important that we know that. And I think of it, this is Cindy's version, I think of righteous anger as the right use of anger, the right use of anger. Righteous anger is when we get upset about something, we get mad, we get angry about something, and it's because it's someone else is being, maybe it's oppression. We see somebody being oppressed. We see somebody being abused. We see somebody being hurt. Um, children that are hungry, children that are trafficked. We just have, and we have this righteous anger that that is not okay. And the right use of anger is when it is channeled into doing the right thing for someone who is oppressed. You following me there? So there's right anger, and then there's misused anger. A righteous anger should always propel us, think about here this, to right a action. A righteous anger should propel us to right action. I'm stuttering action. Jesus showed us the right use of anger. In uh, the book of Mark, let's look at that, chapter 3 and 5, it's the Sabbath day, and Jesus was, at this point in his life, he's being followed around by these religious leaders. They're just going everywhere he goes. They are trying to trip him up. They are looking for everything they can to find fault with him. They're hoping to find fault with him, get him in trouble, get him out of the picture. And so it's, a, it's the Sabbath. Now the Sabbath in those days was a time when you did no work. 
and it was a law. And so I imagine that particular day, these particular religious leaders were just following around on the Sabbath trying to catch him in something, doing work. And there's a man there with a withered hand. Now, the context in biblical times with a man with a withered hand or a woman, or if, if, if there's um, a physical ailment, if, if, they're, if they can't walk, if they're blind, if they're deaf, if they have a withered hand, that usually means that their life is going to be really, really difficult. It means that they're not going to have work. It means that they're going to be looked down on by, in society. And so Jesus looks at this man with this withered hand on the Sabbath. And my Jesus is full of compassion, and he cares deeply for this man. And I just know, because I know him. I know who he is. His heart is breaking for this man, and he says to these religious leaders, he's like, what? Because I can imagine they're just staring, like waiting, like, what are you going to do? And Jesus looks and is like, what? Is it wrong to do good for this man? And then Jesus shows us the right use of anger. He says, Jesus looked at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. But it's not the right use of anger that we usually need to figure out. It's all the other forms of anger that hurt us and that hurts the people that we love and the people we do life with. We all know what anger is. We've all felt it. We've all been the recipient, I think, of someone's anger. And sometimes it's minor and fleeting. It just is real quick. Somebody gets irritated. Sometimes it's hot and flashy. Whoo! And it just burns everything up in its path. And then it burns out. And then other anger simmers. You know what that kind is? Just simmers all the time, just simmering in them. Never leaves them. It's constant. It's just simmering until it explodes. And it can run the gamut. Anger, it can run from just being mad all the way to rage. It is an unpredictable and it's a powerful emotion. And that's why there's so many scriptures that teach us about anger. I was thinking back to a time when I was the most angriest in my life. It's kind of shocking to me when I look back at how angry I was. So I was pregnant with our first child, and um, I went to the doctor's office for a prenatal visit. And while I'm in the office, the receptionist, as I'm checking out, she says, oh, um, since you don't have any insurance. And I'm like, no, no, that's mistaken. We We have good insurance. See, we'd already done all the math and figured everything out. And this is back, way back in the day, guys. If you're, like, young, uh, you're not going to follow this. But we didn't, nothing was on the computers. <laughs> they literally went to a file and pulled my folder out, right? It's all written. Everything came through the mail. It was snail mail for this. And so um, she, ins- she informs me that we don't have any insurance, and she's like, here's, here's what our cost is going to be for the OB, and then here's the estimated charges that you can expect from the hospital. And I am just standing there in shock. And I learned, and, and as I'm going out the door, I, I mean, I realized that his employer had stopped, my husband's employer had stopped paying the premiums, and the insurance had dropped, and he hadn't told us about that. And I remember going out to the car, I was by myself, and I got behind the driver's the wheel, steering wheel, and I sat there, and I felt this anger just coming up in me until it went from anger to rage. And I thought to myself, if that man were to walk in front of my car right now, I would hit the gas. Anger is a powerful emotion. I mean, think about it. You can go on YouTube. I don't want you to, by the way. Don't do this. But if you were, you could go to YouTube, and you could download video after video after video of people raging and other people videoing it because they think we all need to know, I guess. You you can go to, you, you can go, like, if you clicked in kids' sports events, 
You'll download, you know, kids at this little seven-year-old's game somewhere, and you've got, you've got coaches raging against these teenage referees, just lighting into them while little kids just stand there and watch. You can download and find videos of parents brawling at a child's sporting event. And I want to tell you something, this kind of rage, this kind of rage, it's, it's not about the sporting event. It's not about a call that the ref made. It's about something that goes much deeper than that. Because we know that anger and rage, while it's powerful, is a secondary emotion. That means there is something always behind it. An unhealthy anger is something that I know personally, I've had to ask God to help me with it. I have, had to, I have said to God, search me. Know my heart. Why am I doing this? Clear this up for me. Because my uh, method of anger it looks like this. Some people will hit and hurt and break and scream, and you know they're in a rage, right? Mine tends to be stuff it all down. Stuff it all down, stuff it all down. And then I don't, it's, it's, it's kind of a cold <laughs> anger. I, and then when I get it all stuffed down, I, I don't explode. I just disconnect from you. It's as if you don't exist anymore. And that is incredibly unhealthy, incredibly unhealthy. And I had to get real from God, real with God. I had to say to him, God, search me. What is this offensive thing in my heart that I do that it is not of you, Lord? Show me what this is. Let's get the clear picture. Help me dig deeper. Help me pick up this shovel and dig deeper and find out where is this coming from? What is this all about? And so today my prayer has been, my prayer has been that someone today if you are dealing with any of these landmines, it doesn't have to just be anger today, but it might be anger. But if you're dealing with addiction, if you're dealing with trauma like shame and fear and all the stuff that goes with it, and so much of this is interconnected, my prayer today is that you would join me in digging deeper when it comes to this, these landmines in your life, that you would pick up the shovel and you do the hard work because I just want to share with you, I've got family with addiction. I'm, I have a direct, it affects me. I've had anger. I, I just, the shame, all of this stuff is so real. And I have learned that if we don't have the courage and trust in God to pick up the shovel and do the hard work, we will struggle with it forever. It will always be with us and we, until we get to the bottom of it. So let's talk about what the Bible says about anger. So there's lots of stories in the Bible about anger, okay? Right off the bat, in the beginning, in Genesis, Cain, the two brothers, right? Cain loses his, he becomes enraged at Abel, and Cain murders his brother. Moses, you can read about Moses losing his temper. You can read about King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, he was, I mean, full of wrath. Uh, he, there were, this was a huge pride issue for him. There were three young Hebrew boys, the fiery furnace. You've probably heard that Bible story. If you haven't, it's a good one. Um, he, these, he says, bow down to me, and these three young men are like, nope, not doing it. There's only one true God. They refuse to have him as an idol, and he is so enraged that he, he throws them into fire. King Herod when uh, at the, we always hear about the Christmas story, we read about the birth of baby Jesus and the whole story and what leads up to that. But while King Herod became so enraged, he's hunting down this Christ child and he can't find him. And so he devises a plan that he will murder all the children under the age of two. And the scripture uses the word, he became enraged. Jonah, this might be my favorite, <laughs> because Jonah disobeys God. Remember that story? God says, Jonah, go to Nineveh. These people in Nineveh, they are far, far from me. They are the, and they were, they were like the meanest, worst, ugliest, nastiest people around. And God's like, I want you to go to Nineveh. 
and I want you to give them a warning that, you know, they need to straighten up and change their ways. Well, Jonah doesn't want to do it, so he's disobedient. You know the story. He refuses. He ends up being swallowed by the whale. And then God, God uh, graciously lets him go, you know, spits him up. And I just always found it ironic that Jonah is so disobedient to God. Because then the Ninevites, when Jonah does go talk to them, then they do turn away from their wicked ways, and God saves them. And that makes Jonah really furious. He wants them to be destroyed. It's just story after story after story in the Bible about anger and about rage. And then there's scriptures. And the scriptures are what we want to cling to. The scriptures speak truth into all of this. The scriptures tell us, here's what you need to do about this. James, James is the half-brother of Jesus. And I don't know if this little side story on James, he didn't believe his half-brother, he didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah until Jesus was crucified and resurrected and then he believed. Nobody wants to believe their brother is the Messiah, you know. So James is the author of this, and James writes, my dear brothers and sisters, he's speaking to the people in the church here. He's saying, take note of this. In other words, I, this is something you really need to know. Mark this down, pay attention to this. This is a big deal. Apparently, he's been watching this happening in the church. You know, sometimes it's really hard to tell an unbeliever from a believer these days because we can be just as unkind and angry and mad in social media or out on the highway or such as someone who doesn't know Christ. And he's saying, dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. You should be quick to listen and slow to speak. James is telling us when something sparks you, when something hits you, this is key, you are to be quick to listen. And I'm going to add something else in here. We're told to listen to the other person and hear their side of it, and then we'll understand, right? Okay, he's telling us to listen, but I want to put in there, the second you start to feel that, that you've been wronged or someone's wronging you, be quick to listen to God. Pause right now and be quick about it, and listen to God. What's he saying to you in that moment? How should you respond? How do you handle this? What is your next step? Because we're not used to that. We live in a really angry world. We live in a mad world where everybody gets mad about something, and they hop on the keyboard, and they shoot out, you know, Facebook rants, and uh, Twitter, and all this stuff, and um, I've just, I've made this rule that if I get mad or angry, uh, I'm not allowed to get on social media, I'm not allowed to send an email, I'm not allowed to text for 24 hours. I just have to give myself time to listen to God. Slow to speak and slow to become angry. And this is why. Human anger, unrighteous anger, not the right kind of anger, but human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Ephesians 4.31 tells us, get rid, of, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of bitterness and rage and anger. And out of that bitterness and rage and anger, you're going to get brawling and slander and other forms of malice, Right? And Ephesians is telling us, get rid of it. That phrase there, we just read it in James. And it's saying, get rid means to take it off. It means you're wearing anger, and you're wearing bitterness, and you're wearing malice, and you're wearing all of this unrighteousness on your being. And James, uh, Paul is saying, get rid of it, take it off. Some people wear their anger like a coat. You know anybody like that? You, you, you kind of walk on eggshells around them, right? You never know when they're going to go off. You don't know when they're going to explode. You don't know what might set them off. And I had someone at first service say to me, you know, Pastor Cindy, I don't just wear a coat. 
I got the whole wardrobe. Everyone that you're with, the drive through window, the cashiers, anybody that follows you on social media, they see it because you walk around in it. It's how you respond to any situation that doesn't go your way. It's how you respond to situations that don't go the way you think they should go. And for some of us, <clears throat> anger's hidden. You don't see it. It's up underneath. It's not so obvious to everyone. In fact, someone may say that you're not an angry person at all, and they would never dream that of you because we keep it hidden under layers. And it looks like different things. For some people, it's just this desire to get even. They've been wronged, they've been hurt, and they just want to get even. For some people, it's deep down wanting to see people fail. You ever had somebody hurt you, offend you, go against you, and you don't do anything, but deep down you really hope that they fail. Can come off as complaining. A lot of people uh, are very passive-aggressive with their anger. I remember years ago I was on a road trip to meet some friends, and um, earlier that week, like a week prior, the check engine light had come on in my car, so I ignored it. And I'm driving down the road, and it's before, you know, it's early in the morning, no, it's dark out, it's pouring the rain, and that car just dies out in the middle of nowhere. And I want to tell you this, I have learned I will always pay attention when the check engine light is on. I learned a valuable lesson. When that light comes on, it means something is wrong, something's wrong inside the vehicle, an unhealthy anger. It's like the check engine light of our soul, of our hearts, of our minds. It's a signal to us. So don't ignore it. If you find yourself, you're angry all the time, don't ignore this. Don't let this go. Hey, do not think that it's everybody else. Well, I'm angry because if so-and-so would do this and so-and-so would do that, and if they... That's, that's not your source of anger. It's coming from deep within, and we've got to figure out why that kind of anger is within us. When I picked up the shovel, shovel and I started digging deep, I realized all those years ago that the rage that came up in me, you know, the, one, of the, one of the commandments says, do not murder. And so many of us bounce, I, I had someone share this with me this morning, we bounce right over that one because we're like, well, I haven't murdered anybody. Or maybe you have, I don't know. But I'm just saying, you know, or you know somebody that has. I don't know, but I'm just saying for most of us, we haven't murdered anybody, so we bounce right over that commandment like, eh, that's the one I don't have to worry about. Let me tell you this. I murdered that man in my heart. I thought, I want him. It's a good thing he was not in town that day. I wanted him to walk in front of my car so I could hit the gas. And when I dug deeper and I said, search me, oh God, what is going on here? Why, do I, why did I feel such a thing? What is happening? God showed me that it was fear. The anger was the secondary emotion, and it was coming out of fear. I just was overwhelmed with the fact we didn't have money to begin with. We went paid day to pay day, and here we are married young, and now we're going to have a baby, and what are we doing? We can't even pay the bills. Why are we doing this? How are we going to provide for ourselves? All this fear started coming up in me, and it was just spiraling and spiraling and spiraling. And then that fear just brought on, I took it out on this person. And, and it was the anger and the rage, but it was fear that I could not, we weren't going to be able to provide for our family. And then God said, dig a little bit deeper. And so I dug deeper, and God revealed to me, the reason you have fear is because you don't trust me. You don't trust me that I will provide for you. So what if you don't have insurance? I'll provide for you. I will take care of you. Often you need to keep digging until you get to that root. And then when you get to that root and you dig it out of there and you work on that, that's when true healing 
can take place. That's the place where I learned the characteristics of God. That's the place in my life where I learned that he had my back and that I could always count on God and he would be there because you know what, that story, we didn't know a dime from any of that, those expenses. God took care of all of that. And I just want to go through a few more things that might help you. You know, sometimes our anger, um, especially if you've got the flare kind, the you just find yourself grouchy and mad and irritated and you're snapping at your spouse, you're snapping at your kids all the time, your co-workers, your, you know, the second that, you know, light turns green, you're blowing the horn. Some of us, it's coming from things like, we're just running too hard, man. We have no margins in our life. We are just go, 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 go. It's sleep deprivation, there's no rest, there's no quiet time. We just go from one thing to the next thing, and we're living on this stress, a high level of stress. And that can also, that can be a trigger. And then you gotta dig deeper and say, why? Why are we doing that? Some of us, we just try to live in our own strength. For some of us, it's coming from a place, like I said, that second, the other emotion, maybe there's fear, there's pride. It's usually because we've got unresolved issues in our life. For, we might have resentment or unforgiveness towards someone, unresolved trauma. There's been things that's happened to us in our life as children or young people that never got resolved. It's broken trust. People damaged us. People hurt us. And that's not okay. It's not okay that they did that. And for some of us, we're angry with God. Maybe you're angry with God this morning because you prayed and prayed for something. You prayed that someone would be healed. You prayed for an outcome, a certain outcome. And God didn't answer that prayer the way you wanted it to be answered, the way you were praying for it to be answered. And you're like, why God? Why do you do this for so-and-so, but you don't do this for me? And, and that becomes anger in your heart. That, that fear and that hurt is anger. And maybe, I, I, know, I have a friend now, she, she reads the Bible, and she's just like, I am so mad at God. I read the Bible, and I don't agree with some things that he requires of us. I don't agree with the way he says some things have to be. Why does it have to be this way? And so she's angry at God. But here's the reality of all this. Our inability to get to the root of our anger and at the root of all these, all these landmines in our life, it's destroying our relationships. That's what the enemy wants. <laughs> he wants to destroy any good thing that you have and it's destroying relationships, it's destroying marriages, it's damaging relationships all in our, our, our neighborhood and our community that we do life with, and it damages our relationship with God. And this is not how God designed you and I to function. This is not his plan for you. His plan for you is to have life abundantly. His plan for you is to live in freedom. His plan is for you to walk in peace. His plan is for you to not feel this depression and to feel this anxiety and fear and shame and to be angry all the time. That is not his plan for you. And the thing about this is God wants us to be spiritually and emotionally whole. Paul tells us, do not sin in your anger. Because that's usually what happens. Sooner or later, you can bet we're going to sin in our anger. And anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires for his people. You can't deal with this kind of anger without Jesus. That's just the bottom line. You can't deal without Jesus. You can't do it in your own power. You can't do it in your own strength. You can't address it especially when you're in the middle of it, when you're in the moment of it, that's not the time to address it and make a plan. I'll go back to the question that I asked you in the very beginning when we started this morning. 
I ask you, are you willing to do the work that it takes to dig deeper and get rid of the anger in your life? Are you willing to do the work that it takes to dig deeper for all these things, the, the, the addictions and the fear and the shame and the anger? And you can add whatever you want to that, whatever you're struggling with. You've got to spend time with Jesus. You've got to address the issue. You've got to repent. And you know, repent, repenting, we always talk about repentance like it's a negative thing. I've got to repent. Or we've heard it through our lives as shaming, you know, repent, repent, repent. I think repentance is such a beautiful thing because it's God's grace to us when he says, you're going this direction and it's death. And I want you to turn around. I'm going to repent and I'm going to turn around and I'm going to walk this way towards God, towards life. That's true repentance. You've got to repent. You've got to spend time with Jesus. You've got to address the issue. You've got to listen to him. Listen to him and let him speak to you. Allow him to show you what's behind the anger. He might point you towards counseling. And I, I wanted to tell you, if that's something you've been being drawn to, you feel like this thing, this root is so strong and, du- and it's just so just dug in there that I can't get it out. You know, I just, faith-based counseling can be just the thing that you need. You might need somebody to help you dig along deeper and get to the root of it. God might tell you you need to forgive somebody, that you've been holding on to bitterness and anger and unforgiveness in your heart, and until you let that go and forgive them and trust God to take care of it, he'll take care of justice. He'll take care of all that, that you're not going to be able to release the anger. You might need to make some changes in the rhythms of your life to give yourself more margins. Whatever it might be this morning, I just want you to let him begin the healing process. Let him um, show you the places in your life that anger covers over. Would you stand with me this morning? As we close, I want to read a scripture over you. I felt impressed to do this particular scripture I'd like for you to bow your heads and close your eyes because I just want you to absorb the words. If you want, you can even reach your hands out, palms up, say, Lord, I receive this. I receive this, Lord. It comes from Hebrews chapter 4. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Sometimes it feels like you can't hang on to it, doesn't it? It's a daily battle. But we have Christ. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. No. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he has not sinned. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy. And here's the part I want you to remember. And find grace to help us in our time of need. Father, we thank you this morning. I thank you for your word. Thank you for sending your son Thank you that he did all the work on the cross for us so that we could be free from this bondage, so that we could be free from anger and the stuff underneath, Lord, the rocks and the bad dirt and soil, Father, that just traps it in there. I pray, God, that you would give your people courage today as you have been with us in this service, if you have spoke to them, Lord, that they would have the courage to pick up the shovel and dig deeper because they want to be set free from this, Lord. Set them free today, Lord. Begin to do your work. Begin to do a work, Lord, that only you can do. 
Father, I pray against the enemy because he would like to bring shame to them. He would like to um, rationalize stuff. He would like to say, hey, it's not you. Don't, yeah, don't listen to that. If, if, if this was better in your life and if this changed, God, we just, we just push him out in the name of Jesus that he would have no place here. And I ask you to guard and protect the minds of your people, Lord, especially those who are struggling with this. And I pray that when they walk out of here today, Lord, that they, even though they've got a lot of work to do, a lot of hard lifting to do, you are going to stand right next to them and do the heavy lifting with them. And I believe, Lord, there will be a day they will say, I am free from this. God has set me free. And they're going to be able to live and walk in that freedom. And they're going to walk in power and authority because they are your sons and daughters. You are the king of kings and we are yours. We are your children And you want to give us good gifts, and I thank you for that. I ask all these things, Lord, in your name. And God's people said, amen, amen. All right, you can head on out. We're so glad you came with us today. If anybody needs prayer this morning, doesn't matter what it is, you, want, you need prayer or somebody you love or know needs prayer, a few of the pastors are going to hang around here in the uh, worship center and uh, just find us and we would love to pray with you. Have a great rest of your Sunday.